Hello everyone and thanks for joining us for the fourth annual The Science of Cannabis online symposium. I'm Jack Rudd, Editorial Director for Anatol Cannabis and I'm here to moderate today's event with my colleague Roxanne Newman. Before we start the talks today, I just have some general information and a few tips for getting the most out of today's event. Firstly, as well as the fantastic lineup of speakers we have for you, I'd like to point out the networking area on the platform, which you can use to chat to other delegates throughout the day. Once you enter the networking area, you'll see a public chat room in the centre. On the right hand side, you'll see a list of users who are online in your chat room. From here, you can invite them to a private chat, which will appear in a small window at the bottom of your screen. I encourage you to get involved and take this opportunity to speak to some of the over two and a half thousand delegates that have registered for today's event. Please remember, we encourage debate and discussion and welcome all of you to use our networking services to introduce yourselves to other attendees. But we do not commit the overt solicitation of products or services and reserve the right to block any user who infringes on this rule. If you do wish to discuss specific products or technologies, please utilize our sponsors chat rooms. I'm sure they would love to hear from you. On a similar note, all of today's talks offer the ability for you to engage with our speakers via the Q&A session at the end of each talk. I encourage all of you to ask questions as this is the best opportunity to get live answers from our panel of cannabis industry experts. I'll explain how you can ask questions at the start of each presentation. It's also incredibly important to say that this event was only made possible thanks to the generosity of our sponsors and partners, particularly our platinum sponsor, Millipore Sigma. In the literature section, you can download free educational pieces from our sponsors and partners, including application notes, white papers, and guides focused on cannabis science and testing. We would like to ask if you could please refrain from video, audio, or photo recording of all of talks today. All of our speakers have kindly agreed to share their slides with you, and these are available within the literature section on the platform. On a similar note, please use the ask a question feature to request permission to cite any of the speakers' presentations in your work. Some of our speakers will be providing their contact details in their presentations. If they do, please feel free to make these requests directly. We would love to hear your feedback on the event today and would really appreciate it if you complete a short survey which will be sent out to you later this week via email. All feedback is welcome and will aid us in the production of future analytical cannabis online events. If you'd like to contact the Analytical Cannabis team directly today or in the future, our email address is available on the help desk section. And with that, I will hand over to Roxanne to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Jack. Hello, everyone. I'm Roxanne Newman, conference producer for Analytical Cannabis, and I'm here to introduce the first talk in today's event. Edible dosing, building product trust and reliability. I'm really pleased to have Rhiannon Wu joining us today as your presenter. Rhiannon is the co-founder and CSO of Trace Trust, the company that established a true dose and HGMP, the first universal independent certification programs for dose accuracy in legal cannabis and hemp derived ingestible products. Rhiannon is an industrial designer for food safety and quality programs, instructor for environmental effects of foodborne pathogens and certified HACCP trainer. Rhiannon is an expert in good agricultural practices, good harvesting practices, Good Manufacturing Practices, HACCP and the Food Safety Modernisation Act. A warm welcome to you, Rhiannon. Following the presentation, we will have a Q&A session and we would welcome any questions that you may have. Please ask questions using the Q&A tab below the video player. If you experience any technical issues during the presentation, please request help using the Q&A system. I will now hand over to Rhiannon. Hello, thank you, Roxanne. Thank you all for joining us here today. If you Google CBD candy, you'll get 22 million results with products available to be shipped to your door from around the world. But if you purchase one of these products, do you know what you'll get? Heading back to Google this time searching for fake CBD, you'll find 15 million hits with blog posts and self-promoting companies touting easy ways to differentiate the real stuff, of course it's theirs, from the fake, which is everyone else's. In this session, we'll cover the popularity of edibles and ingestibles as a way to consume cannabis, uh, as well as a major risk to the growth of the industry and the opportunity for third-party certification in the cannabis industry. 
And when, in, as part of that, we'll talk about how brands can communicate their commitment to customer safety using their label. As the COVID-19 related shutdowns rippled across the US and Canada earlier in the year, cannabis and hemp businesses were widely recognized as providing essential goods to millions of people. This validation by numerous state and local governments that cannabis products have been integrated into the daily lives of US and Canadian residents to manage their health and wellness. Being deemed essential goods meant that the cannabis consumers had as minimal disruption to their access as possible during this trying time. The essential business status reflects the growing popularity and acceptance of cannabis and cannabis products. 80% of Americans support federal legalization even when they themselves do not consume cannabis. In the 2017 National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute survey, 81% of respondents stated that they believe cannabis has medical benefits, with these benefits ranging from pain management, uh, treatment of diseases such as epilepsy and multiple sclerosis, and relief from anxiety, stress, and depression. And again, whether or not a person consumes cannabis, the vast majority of people support legalization in no small part because greater legalization and access will mean that more of these medical benefits can be explored. In addition to the consensus that cannabis has many known and undiscovered medical benefits, another driver of the improved public perception around cannabis consumption is based on the evolution of consumption methods. 70% of cannabis users consume edibles or ingestibles at least some of the time, whether those are traditional edibles such as baked goods or chocolate, or whether they are more medical form factors such as tablets or gel caps. This is especially true for older consumers, the majority of whom prefer a non-inhaled method of consumption and are looking to incorporate cannabis products into their daily wellness practice. In response to the demand for cannabis wellness products and the reclassification of industrial hemp, the CBD industry has exploded over the last five years. This industry has seen rapid growth while at the same time having very unpredictable amount of regulatory oversight. There are products manufactured in strict compliance with good manufacturing practices and others that are made with little concern over product safety and quality. How is the customer supposed to quickly evaluate what products are high quality and which products to pass on? I'm sure you've seen one of these news reports. The local consumer protection reporter goes to various retail shops in their area local grocery stores, gas stations, and convenience stores, maybe even a yoga studio to purchase widely available products that claim to have CBD. And without fail, once these products have gone through testing, multiple of them test with, test with little to no detectable CBD. The growth of legal cannabis, hemp, and CBD-derived products is at risk if there's no clear way to identify which products are safe, reliable, trustworthy, and even contain the active ingredients stated on the label. Consumer trust is lost when they don't get a predictable experience. We all know of at least one person who has sworn off edibles and ingestibles after one too many bad experiences. And there are all the news reports of even celebrities and news reporters having unpredictable results when they consume products without clear instructions. And it's not just over the top or too much cannabis consumption experience that can sour the customer relationship. It's also the instances where the customer says, I didn't feel anything. Those experiences can make consumers think that the products aren't as beneficial as some claim. As our industry grows, it won't just be one or two people opting out of the entire edibles category. It could be thousands, and they will be posting reviews on the e-commerce and review platforms, influencing the future purchases of thousands of others. When people shop on e-commerce sites, especially such as Amazon, one of the greatest drivers of their shopping decisions is the positive reviews of other purchasers. So what can the industry do to build public trust? Right now, there is not a universally adopted validation program for dose accuracy or a global standardization of testing, testing methods. And this leaves us open to consumer misinformation and financial risk and liability for our businesses. But as we, have, as we go into this next phase of our industry, there are more and more uh, opportunities for those standardizations to be adopted. Across the consumer goods spectrum, third-party audits and certifications 
offer independent assessment and assurance to customers and retail buyers. These voluntary programs offer the opportunity for the wider consumer goods industry to regulate themselves according to consumer expectations, whether for sustainability, supply chain integrity, implementation of good manufacturing practices, worker welfare, or any other program valued by their customers. Many of these programs require producers and manufacturers to have comprehensive quality management systems with ongoing validation. And in, and in many of these cases, that will mean testing, testing of raw materials, testing of work in process, and testing of finished goods, whether that's for human pathogens, pesticide residues, solvent residues, or cannabinoid levels. Third-party audits and certifications often, often rely on certificates of analysis from third-party labs to provide documentary evidence of production controls, which make those labs valuable partners to both producers and auditors. In the absence of standard methods, those labs have had to develop and validate their own methods through, often through painstaking research and development. These proprietary methods may have some standard elements, such as using chromatography, liquid or gas chromatography, but sample preparation methods, solvents used, and other specifics can vary. And anecdotally, producers report starkly different results between labs. Interlab discrepancies might fall well within a normal distribution curve, or they might represent true differences between labs. With so many labs using different methods, it can be nearly impossible for auditors and quality managers to correctly compare labs that were to correctly compare products that were tested at different labs. As the cannabis industry develops third-party audits and other standards, reducing interlaboratory discrepancy becomes imperative and also understanding whether we have interlaboratory discrepancy or whether we're actually seeing a normal distribution of results due to uh, simple factors such as variant in sample size or sample, take, sample taking. One obvious way to reduce interlab discrepancy is to reduce the number of different methods being used. It may be tempting for retailers and third-party auditing companies to require their supply chains to use specific laboratories. In other consumer goods sectors, we have seen this approach. While this does simplify things for those retailers and third-party auditing companies, this can create unnecessary bottlenecks. When there is a priority lab, that lab quickly becomes uh, over capacity and unable to process new, new samples quickly and efficiently. Another approach to reduce the number of methods is to encourage the broad adoption of standard methods. With, with widespread legalization of hemp around the world, more and more standards organizations are building and combining standards for la cannabis laboratory processes. However, for laboratories, their proprietary methods are valuable intellectual property, and it's a significant risk for them to participate in the consensus building process and share those internal documents. And so we are faced with a situation where the best way to reduce the number of the best way to reduce the number of methods being used is very unattractive to the labs who would want to achieve more standardization. So there are also approaches where labs can retain the proprietary methods while still establishing equivalency between different lab methods through participation in multi-lab blind studies. This goes beyond the standardization that's required in the ISO certification process and actually allows the labs to form associations with one another and start to normalize their results against one another. Uh, it's very simple for these associations to form. Uh, labs just come in together with an agreement and test a, a statistically significant sample across all labs and review the data together. Uh, as these labs build this trust, not only with one another and uh, with the, their consumers, the, the, produ the cannabis producers, this helps build trust and also lab capacity across the industry. But cannabis manufacturers and producers want more than just reliable certificates of analysis. They want a partner. How can a cannabis lab really differentiate themselves in this area? More than anything else, cannabis producers, especially the startups and new brands, want a partner to help them understand where variability in their product comes from and how to protect themselves against that variability. 
if a CBD gummy fails pesticide residue testing, but every component was already tested and already passed, producers are quick to blame the lab for a lab error and current test failing. And it can be very tempting for the lab to blame the production error. But what if those pesticide residues were there the whole time, but were not identified because of an inadequate sampling plan? Producers, especially small producers, are constantly trying to balance their desire for 100% confidence in their ingredients, process, and product against the cost of testing. Labs and producers should work together to develop risk-based sampling plans. Ingredients that are homogenous and expected to meet expectations can have reduced sampling, while non-homogenous and suspicious ingredients can have expanded sampling. By moving away from a one-size-fits-all sampling plan, the producer can spend their money on more impactful testing and increase their likelihood of identifying problematic ingredients before they go into full production. Let's think about this through a scenario. Scenario one, you're getting ready to jump into a nice, soft, fluffy pile of hay in your bare feet. Just before you jump, your friend says, oh no, what if there's a needle? Of course, being a rational person, you stop to think things through. Did anyone see a needle near the hair stack? Was someone sewing nearby? Is there any reason to think there might be a needle in the haystack? In normal circumstances, you don't expect for there to be a needle in the haystack. So we'll say this haystack is expected to meet the requirements of not having any needles. Then we need to figure out, are haystacks homogenous or not? A quick review of the nature of hay, you conclude that haystacks are expected to be homogenous, that the, the hay is evenly distributed and all of the hay is very similar to all of the other hay. And so we'll conclude that based on the risk factors of this particular haystack, we can do some limited sampling and we don't, if we don't find a needle, then we're good to jump. But let's consider a different scenario. Instead of, instead of having no belief that there's a needle present, your friend informs you that there was a sewing group here in the barn the day before. And due to an unfortunate series of events, a thousand needles was, were spilled into the haystack. And to make matters worse, this haystack is not just yellow fluffy hay. It's a mixture of yellow hay and a silvery weed that looks remarkably like needles. And the needles are not evenly distributed throughout the haystack. There was a place where they fell and all of the needles were a, a, a group together in one area, but your friend does not remember what that area is. These risk factors significantly change the sampling plan. Instead of a cursory check for a needle, just in case, a thorough inspection of a significant portion of the haystack is in order. So using this thought process, we can understand that when we don't expect to find a problem, we can have reduced sampling. And whether we don't expect to have a problem through a history of not having a problem, we have a very reputable supplier that has never had a problem with any of their ingredients that they've sent us before, we can have reduced sampling. Or if we have a product that we suspect is non-conforming, we can have expanded sampling. Of course, when it comes to our cannabis product ingredients, we aren't dealing with needles and haystacks. We're dealing with pesticide residue on fruits or heavy metals and sugar. An inadequate number of samples can lead to non-compliant finished products, especially in markets with very strict finished testing, finished goods testing requirements. Understanding where ingredients come from, how they're handled, and what types of contaminants are most likely can help a producer or manufacturer develop their testing plan so that they can focus on the higher risk ingredients and even transfer some of that testing burden to the raw material suppliers. And this is very important as we expand across uh, the legalized market. More and more producers are coming into the marketplace, but they often start at a startup phase, a very limited production. And at limited production, they have a decreased access to ingredient traceability information. So it becomes really imperative to understand where do these risk factors come from. Um, these strawberries are here on our screen because strawberries are notorious for having uh, unsafe pesticide residue levels even at the retail uh, level. So that means that uh, consumer watchdog groups can go into the grocery store, 
cool strawberries and a high percentage of them will test positive for uh, out of compliance pesticide residues. So do producers really need to increase their testing if they're already doing finished product testing on every lot? It all comes down to how they're building trust with their customers. Consumers that are new to cannabis are especially looking for safety and reliability. They have much less tolerance for unexpected results than more experienced users. Brands that are focused on parents, women, or seniors rely on the trust they establish between themselves and their customers. And as they come into the space, these consumers are also very label savvy. These consumers are very, very used to interrogating the label of their product and understanding certain key aspects of those things. Producers can therefore show their work by completing a third party certification program and adding their certification marks to their product labels. These consumers are very used to seeing things like organic certification, non-GMO, uh, fair trade. They're used to looking for these marks because they represent a nod to their values that the producer shares values with them and is following, the, following prescribed procedures that they themselves would agree to. So these are more than just beauty marks. These seals of approvals are a shorthand way for producers and manufacturers to communicate with their customers about all the extra care that is taken to create their products over and above the regulatory requirements. And more than that, this communicates to the, to the buyer, to the consumer, the finished consumer, that this company makes decisions that they themselves would agree with, especially consumers who are used to looking for these certification marks, especially around uh, worker welfare, fair trade, um, supply chain integrity, uh, they want to know that when they buy a product from a company, that their values are shared with that company. So producers who are going through the certification process will be looking for labs who can be their partner throughout this process. First and foremost, by providing trusted certificates of analysis, but also by helping them troubleshoot any issues that are uncovered as they develop their risk-based testing strategies. It's in our interest to have systems to build trust across the industry. Producers, laboratories, and third-party audit programs can work together to increase consumer confidence and help those brands that go beyond regulatory requirements to stand out in the crowd. And this is not a one-size-fits-all system. Each producer, audit company, and laboratory group, each project will have its own unique factors. And it's important as laboratories and third-party audit companies that we work together to understand where this variability in our supply chain comes from and how we can best support the producers to improve that. And as I said earlier, often these producers are a very small scale to start off with and don't have access to traceability and testing documents from the supply chain. And so it's up to us to understand how can we develop those testing programs so that they don't have an undue burden of testing costs, but they still have high confidence in their results. So as we move together to develop these programs, it's imperative that labs and audit companies form a very close relationship so that multiple labs across our space are going to be well-versed in developing into helping producers develop these testing programs. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and I am now available to take a few questions. Thank you very much Rhiannon, a brilliant talk to start the day. I know that we're going to have lots of questions so we'll move straight on to the Q&A now so that we can cover as many as possible. The first question we have had in is where is the gap in testing protocols? So as we said earlier, one of the issues in the testing protocols is that every lab has developed these proprietary methods. But beyond that, one of the gaps in the testing protocol is really in the selection of the sample size. Um, when we're talking about that statistically valid sample size, we're really talking about large samples. And so there's all different types of methods for determining what's the right amount of product to sample. Um, one of the common, common methods being uh, AQL tables, uh, acceptable, acceptable quality limit tables, which are very easy to use standardized methods to say, if I produce X number of units, this is 
how many samples I should take to, to be sure that if there's an error present that I find it. But when you look at those tables, uh, we're looking at if you produce a thousand uh, units, you might have a testing burden of 50, uh, of 50 samples or more. And when we're talking about destructive testing, so you, you know we send that product to the lab, it cannot be recovered, so it's destructive testing. It really becomes cost prohibitive very quickly to have that really robust sampling plan. And so that's where this cooperation between the producers, uh, that's where the cooperation between producers, third party audits and laboratories really comes into play is to understand, okay, the, the best case scenario testing plan um, where you would have a very high confidence level that if there was a non-conforming ingredient, it would be found. It's just too expensive for producers, especially small producers, to have that testing. So what can be done? Um, and that's where really understanding, like, what is the likelihood of that hazard being present? So if we're talking about pesticide residues in different fruit ingredients, there might be a higher likelihood of that of that non-conforming product being present versus if we're talking about maybe heavy metals in organic sugar, there might be a much lower um, likelihood of a hazard being present. And so it's really about understanding, am I testing enough? And so one of the things that we find is that there's just not a large enough sample population to really understand the nature of the ingredients. And even as we talk about interlab discrepancies, a lot of times that is just about sample size issues as well. So, you know, anecdotally, suppliers or producers will say, oh, I, I produced a lot of product and I sent my product to two labs and I got two completely different results. And part of that is their uh, lack of knowledge on how uh, how stable their product is, but it's also a lack of knowledge of understanding how to read lab results and how to compare lab results to one another. And so when they are looking at two separate tests, they are seeing them as fully representative of their entire product and, and not understanding that those two tests represent um, two spot checks of their of their product and so understanding do these tests do these tests have significant variance from one another or do they both fall within the store the normal standard distribution of what you would expect testing results to be and so again those are the two biggest um gaps that I'm seeing right now, it's not necessarily about true interlaboratory discrepancy, although there is some of that. It's understanding, do we have enough data to know if there is that interlaboratory discrepancy there or not? Thank you, Rhiannon. And the next question, what are the most important goals of standardized testing in an emerging marketplace? So one of the reasons that we look at testing is because we're trying to communicate to our, our end consumers, to the, you know, Joe public, that our product is trustworthy. And so if we don't trust our lab partners, we lose our confidence that our own product is trustworthy. And so as we are building this industry, it's not just one producer and one laboratory. It's thousands of producers and hundreds of laboratories around the world. And they're all representing the industry at the same, at, with the same fate, with same, at the same spot with different faces. So in that emerging industry, we have to be able to say which brands can be trusted. And we communicate that trust a lot with our certificate of analysis. So especially in the CBD world, you'll see it's as a marketing, uh, a marketing program that the company will say this lot, you can find the specific certificate of analysis that's tied to this lot on our website because people are looking for that trust. But as we need to also uh, communicate 
to not just the producers, but also the general public, what do those test results actually mean? So one of the biggest ways that testing impacts this trust is by providing results that meet the expectation. So for example, if you go to the doctor and you're going to have a blood test and you know, you, they want to check you know, your red blood cell count. There's not one number. It's not a hard line. If you have above this, this one number, you're, you have too much blood. And if you have below this number, you have too little. It's not like a 10 milligrams per dose. It's not just one number. It's, it's depicted as a range. And part of that is so that people understand that there is a normal discrepancy. There's a normal amount of discrepancy that's expected when you get a blood test. And we are not doing a great job right now communicating that there's a normal amount of discrepancy to be expected when you're getting your product tested. So yes, we are aiming for a certain dosing, but there's an acceptable range and we aren't really communicating to consumers what that acceptable range might be and whether or not products fall in or out of them. Um, but we have that opportunity right now as this industry is emerging to kind of change how we communicate, not just with the producers, but with their customers as well. Understanding to say, hey, this is the right way to read these certificate of analysis. That's great, thank you, Rhiannon. And the next question, what are some of the approaches for testing protocols for different types of products? So right, um, so the biggest thing is to look at the history of that product. Uh, so different approaches to testing protocols are also about understanding, is this product expected to be homogenous or, or is there some difference in this product and you know it's there? So for example, we're, we're talking about random sampling. We're trying to pull out a representative smaller bit of product to say, this smaller amount that I'm testing and I'm sampling is representative of everything else and so when I get good results from this sample, it represents good results for the rest of the product. And so that's where we really need to understand, is the product expected to be homogenous or is there, uh, it's not even an, a product that's not evenly mixed. So just thinking about uh, Rocky Road ice cream. Uh, there was an article in my newspaper over the weekend about different Rocky Road ice creams. And so Rocky Road ice cream is a chocolate base and it has different inclusions. It has some kind of nut, whether it's almonds or walnuts or pecans, and it has uh, a caramel, a caramel uh, syrup, and it has marshmallows. And so we know that we need to sample uh, enough ice cream so that we would get a representative density of all of those inclusions. Because if you just take one scoop, it's kind of hit or miss. What is going to be in that one scoop? Maybe you get all the inclusions, maybe you don't. And so you say, okay, well, what is the rate of inclusion? So if I worked at the ice cream factory, I would say, okay, well, do we put in 5%? Do we put in 1%? And that would influence how much sampling I need to do to, for me to say, okay, I tested 100 scoops of ice cream, and this is the distribution of marshmallows, of almonds, and of caramel sauce that I found. It's in 99% of scoops, it's in 5% of scoops. So what's the right percentage so that I can feel confident that the sampling plan represents the whole batch? Now, this becomes really complicated for small producers because if you are buying, if you're producing a uh, 1,000 bottles of a of a tincture. And maybe you use um, pure sugar, uh, evaporated cane juice as, as one of your ingredients. Now, for a thousand bottles, you know, a thousand two ounce bottles, you're probably going to use five pounds or less of sugar. And so, how much of that sugar are you testing? Uh, is it five grams? Is it the whole bag? Is it a representative sample from a different? of a different bag that represents this bag. A lot of small producers don't understand, am I putting my production at risk by having this sample size? And so I'd say, okay, well, can we compare this 
this product that we currently have, this ingredient that we currently have to past ingredients. And so that's one of the biggest things that we can do is understand, do I have a different set of risks? And do I have a different expected rate of, of non-conforming product? Or is this current batch likely to be very closely related to the last batch? And so one of the things that we can do in the third party audit side of things is to really encourage uh, traceability of our ingredients and that supply chain integrity. That if, if the manufacturers, the producers, when they receive those ingredients, they track it according to lot number, they can, even when they're ordering in small quantities, understand when they're moving from, a, from one lot of ingredients to another lot of ingredient and reduce their testing burden. They only have to test lots when a new lot number comes in. And so as small producer making tincture, you could be buying the same lot of sugar for a year, but you, because you don't expect a difference throughout the, that use of that particular sugar lot, you wouldn't have to continuously test your sugar as it comes in. And so, uh, but that's only possible if you know which lots of sugar that you're using. So the, again, this is a, a three-way relationship. It's not just producers and labs trying to figure out um, what's the right amount of product to test and understanding uh, how, what to test to do. It's also other advisory, um, other advisory sources such as third-party audit companies to say, hey, this is best practices to do lot code traceability on all your incoming materials, and this is why. It helps reduce your testing burden because you'll know that you are using the same lot of raw material, even though you're, produ you're purchasing it over multiple, multiple purchasing events throughout the year. Brilliant, thank you, Rhiannon. And we have time for just one more question, which is, what about the label? What information is needed for consumer safety? So obviously we wanna start off with a really clear ingredients uh, panel. Uh, what consumers are looking for is transparency. They want to know uh, what the ingredients are in their product. Um, they want to know that you have done your due diligence as well. So this is where uh, the savvy consumers are starting to really interrogate the labels. They'll look for things like organic ingredient declaration. So if you use organic sugar, they're going to be looking for that term organic sugar. Uh, but beyond that, they're also looking at what other kind of, um, how do they manage the experience using your product? So, you know, once they trust your product because they trust your, good manufacturing practices and they trust your ingredients, they wanna know how to correctly use your product. And that's one of the things that we really can do to help um, support the consumer and say, okay, this is the um, general use of this product. So if it's a sublingual or a sublingual tincture, say, okay, the normal use of this is um, one, one milliliter or 25 drops twice a day. And with that, you would expect to get, you know, a certain dosage, uh, 10 milligrams of CBD, um, five milligrams of THC, whatever the ratio is that is expected, because that helps them understand how your product fits into the rest of their wellness lifestyle. And so it's not just, um, you know, this is the ingredients and this is a due diligence that I've done. This is my GMP audit. This is my non-GMO. This is my organic. It's also, what's the best way to consume this product? Um, you know, if you use some different dosing methodologies, like, uh, you know, the micro droplets, and you might say, hey, as a warning, uh, if this is a THC infused product, it's made with micro droplets, which means it will take effect in 10 to 15 minutes. Don't consume this as a normal ingestible and expect a, delayed onset. This is going to have rapid onset. Um, vice versa, if uh, you have two beverages and one is a micro droplet beverage and one is a traditional syrup infusion, they're going to have two totally different experiences. But uh, new cannabis consumers, especially those that are new to these brands, 
aren't going to be able to easily differentiate. So it's really a responsible use of the label to, to describe what is the expected experience. Is this a rapid onset? Is this um, a delayed onset because it goes through uh, the tr traditional uh, edibles pathways? Um, is it kind of a in between as a sublingual strip? All of these help consumer understand their experience because as we said earlier, it's not that consumers are distrustful. Most consumers believe in the medical qualities and the benefits of consuming cannabis, but they are unsure if they are going to have a bad experience. And so the more we can communicate on the label how to have a good experience, the more trust we can build in the industry. Thank you very much, Rhiannon. We really appreciate your time today. Just to remind everybody, any questions that we didn't have time to get to will be answered offline as soon as possible. That just leaves me to say thanks again, Rhiannon, and we'll be back soon with the next talk.